Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to the return of Apex in Conversation. We're so happy to have Jocelyn Hong and David Kim with us this afternoon. <clears throat> Moderating today's conversation is Jocelyn Hong. She uh, reopened her namesake lobbying shop, Jocelyn Hong and Associates, LLC, JHA, in 2019. Uh, it began in the early 90s as the first AAPI woman-owned lobbying shop, but being a first proved challenging despite an impressive track record of, track record of success. Fast forward to 2020, and Jocelyn was honored to be recognized as a top lobbyist by the National Institute of Lobbying and Ethics. This recognition required an initial nomination by a peer, support from clients, and also pro bono charitable work. The nominees were then independently judged by a panel. Jocelyn started her career on Capitol Hill as a Senate staff for former astronaut and U.S. Senator John Glenn of Ohio. She later worked on the Committee of Staff for a member of Congress who served on the powerful House Energy and Commerce Committee. She's also a graduate of University of Colorado, Boulder. Tonight, today we have David S. Kim. He became the third secretary of the California State Transportation Agency on July 1st, 2019, following his appointment by Governor Newsom in April of 2019. In this role, David was responsible for the oversight of 40,000 employees across eight departments, boards and commissions whose mission is to ad advance a safe, environmentally sustainable transportation system that maximizes mobility for all Californians. A longtime transportation leader with experience in the private sector, as well as all three levels of government, David has served Vice President Government Affairs for Hyundai Motor Company from 2017 to 2019. Prior to this assignment, David spent nearly eight years in a senior level role at the US Department of Transportation. He served as deputy administrator of the Federal Highway Administration, the number two position in the agency. Additionally, he was the associate administrator for policy and governmental affairs, and before that spent two years as deputy assistant secretary for governmental affairs in the office of the Secretary of Transportation. And with that, I'd like to kick it off to Jocelyn. Okay, thank you so much. That was a great introduction. Um, David, I'm happy to be here with you today. Uh, David and I met some 25 years ago. Um, not More than that. Ages, yeah, I was uh, <laughs> lying about our age, but um, we met a while back and um, you were working on the Hill for uh, Javier Becerra. So tell us about your path from working for Javier, working for the city of LA. I mean, just kind of give a brief um, background on that. Sure. Well, it's great to see you, Jocelyn. Thanks so much uh, to Madeline, Anthony, and Apex for uh, inviting us and for bringing all of us together. Um, well, before I came to DC, I actually spent seven years working in the California State Legislature in both the state capitol in Sacramento, as well as in the district office for a state senator. And so um, I really saw myself as primarily a state and local government kind of guy. And uh, when Javier Becerra, then Assemblyman Becerra, was uh, elected to Congress in 1992, he asked me to come with him to DC. I said, all right, I'll try it for a year or two, but I'm going back to California. I'm a California kid, so I don't know about this DC thing. Well, ended up staying in DC for 25 years. And that's where you and I met, Jocelyn, when I was working for then Congressman Becerra, and you came to lobby me on an issue, and, um, and you were the first Asian American lobbyist I had ever met, um, a woman lobbyist in DC, and, um, and we've known each other since then. So um, as, as Anthony mentioned, I've had the great privilege and fortune of being able to work at all three levels of government, local, state, federal, executive branch, legislative branch, and in a couple of years in the private sector, with Hyundai Motor Company. And so I think all of those experiences combined uh, prepared me well for what I'm currently doing, um, Secretary of Transportation in California. And I've been a transportation policy guy for a long time. A lot of people ask me, well, why, how the heck did you get involved in transportation? Why, why transportation and why not something sexier like international relations or defense or energy policy, healthcare, education, you know, why transportation? And I can go on, I can go on for a long time about why, but it, it was I was drawn to it because transportation is one of those issues that impacts your quality of life. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, your your station in life. It, it impacts you, and also from a 
from a wonky standpoint, maybe a governmental standpoint, in order for transportation programs and projects to become a reality, it takes incredible collaboration and partnership between federal, state, and local government. One level of government cannot do it alone. And, and so I was drawn to that for many different reasons. Uh, so that's the story in a nutshell in terms of uh, how I got to where I am. So um, did you feel the need to go and get like a master's degree or a law degree to do the work you're doing? Because that's a question I get commonly asked. Like after people get out of undergraduate, they're like, should I go to law school? Should I go a master's degree? What do you think about that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I get that as well. I, and I didn't go to law school. I did go to graduate school, um, master's degree in public administration from USC. I, the way I see graduate school is it's a credential. Uh, it's a paper credential. And I don't know if, if um, not having a master's degree would have made a difference in terms of uh, my own career projection. I honestly, honestly do not know. Uh, but at the same time, having that credential, I think signals to the outside world that you have, you have some uh, uh, credibility or knowledge or, or something. So I think maybe in intangible ways, having a master's degree or law degree uh, can help. It's not a guarantee of success by any means. We all know people who have, who don't have a bachelor's degree, who have done tremendously well uh, in whatever uh, work of walk of life uh, they decide to do. So I don't, it's not a guarantee. It is a credential. And whenever people ask me about it, I, I and obviously I'm biased, I try to steer them towards public administration or public policy, uh, because I think that is very practical. Uh, I found it to be very pra practical and pragmatic in, in the line of work we do. Um, and so that's what I always tell people, forget about law school, go to public policy or public administration if you choose to go to graduate school. Um, so as we're talking about it, do you feel like you see enough um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in public service? What, what are your thoughts? Do you feel like we're fairly representative or you know, what are, what are your thoughts there? Well, the good news is our numbers are increasing uh, in all walks of life, including in government, uh, whether it's uh, Capitol Hill, federal government, federal agencies, state government where I work, local government. So it's changing and, and our presence is increasing, but we still have a long way to go. And I, I'm encouraged by the fact that groups like CAPASA, Congressional APA Staff Association is growing. And there are more and more AAPI Hill staffers now, uh, many more than when you, were, you and I were on the Hill and so that's really encouraging. I think that shows that young AAPIs consider policy, government, and politics to be a viable and honorable profession. And so the numbers are changing and we need to keep growing that pipeline and making sure we have a visible presence in all levels of government. Um, and uh, that's, that's the goal, that's the challenge in front of us. Mm -hmm. Those are, and you know what, I want to thank you because I feel like you have done your part to try to make that pipeline grow. I don't know if people know that you, David is one of the founders of Capasa, And at the time, he doesn't recognize that he was a, uh, a founder because they were, he claims they were just uh, staffers getting together for lunch. But when I started on the Hill and I was one of the only, you know, AAPI people that from, well, mostly people from Hawaii, but working for a member of Congress from Ohio or a senator from Ohio, um, I didn't realize that, you know, there was a group that actually got together because, I mean, there was like one other person I knew, Deborah Wada, who worked for, uh, who became the uh, undersecretary for readiness under the Obama administration, and she was the only person I saw. So um, it was really enlightening, you know, to meet David, but, you know, talk about the, uh, you know, the staff associations and, uh, you know, what, what you've seen in terms of growth. Yeah, as you mentioned, we started, or a bunch of us started CAPASA back in the 90s, and it was really meant to be more of an informal group. We didn't have officers or anything like that or membership dues. And we would get together for lunch, uh, usually a brown bag lunch, and we would try to have a guest speaker uh, someone from the outside to inspire us and, and uh, provide wisdom and advice. And so that's how it started. And it was, um, it was really a labor of love. And I think we all enjoyed each other's company, but also we wanted to give people a chance to get to know one another outside of their own individual office and, and network and, and kind of help 
grow their careers and, and, um, and learn and uh, develop their leadership skills and, and their professionalism. So that's how it started. And uh, again, it's so great to see Kapasa grow by leaps and bounds over the years uh, where you have officers and uh, more structured, organized activities than what we did. Uh, so I, I just hope it continues. And uh, related to that, it's so great that there are more and more AAPI chiefs of staff on the Hill. Uh, we're seeing those numbers increase. We got to keep pushing and, and making sure that AAPI staffers have the opportunity to uh, be promoted to those positions. And so I think uh, there's a long way to go, but it's, but it's encouraging in terms of where we've been and where we're going to go. Okay. So um, I'm sure you faced a lot of challenges in your life. Um, what do you think is the best qualities to have for someone who wants to make it on Capitol Hill in the administration or in public service? Yeah, that's a, that's a very broad question. And a, I guess a couple of things come to mind. Um, and we always hear the term resiliency and being resilient. And that's absolutely true. Um, we, all, we all experience setbacks in life, either uh, professionally or personally. And we should not let those setbacks um, keep us down. Those setbacks do not define who we are. Uh, they are learning experiences. Um, and you, you reflect on it, you think about it, you take those lessons learned, and then you move forward. And so I think it's really important for all of us to keep plugging away and to really, really inject ourselves into everyday life, to, uh, to approach life with a lot of gusto and enthusiasm and positivity, and know that you're out there to, to make a difference, as corny as that sounds, to uh, make a difference and to make things happen and to be proactive. I, I've learned that over the years that uh, we have to make things happen. Things are not gonna happen for us. Sometimes they happen to us, but if we want good things to happen, it's really up to us to make those things happen, to be proactive, have that proactive mindset and to say, it, it's really up to me to, um, to, to get this outcome or to uh, uh, reach, this, uh, reach a certain uh, milestone or goal. So I think it's all about mindset and not letting uh, setbacks get in the way. We, we can learn from them and we just, we just go forward. You know, and I think that that's such, I agree with you. I think resiliency and the ability to not let a setback become a defining factor in your life is, is probably the best advice to give. Um, I think um, another place where you got really active was after the LA riots. I mean, that's actually another time that um, we, we met was working on the National Conference on Korean American Leadership, which stemmed from the KAC, um, the Korean American Coalition in LA that formed after the Rodney King riots. Um, you made a lot of great friends there. I mean, what was it like working as a community activist on a, on a voluntary basis? Yeah, and I think um, that effort goes hand in hand with, with government. And what's really interesting is when you think back to those years, you know, so many years ago, 30 years ago or more, the issues back then and the challenges back then are the same as they are today, which is we as a community um, are always striving for greater visibility, greater, a greater voice, a bigger voice, more prominent voice and, um, and, and presence and making our presence known to the broader world that we are here, uh, we count, we matter, we have a voice, and we are going to contribute uh, to civic life in, in America. So those were the challenges back then. There are still the challenges today. And um, we, so from that standpoint, we have, we have a ways to go. And the, uh, what happened in 1992 in LA, um, LA riots, uh, that was uh, a function of the Korean American community perhaps being taken for granted by the powers that be, by, um, by law enforcement, by others. And so there was a concerted effort to really raise and elevate um, the, the community's presence and to say, we he we're here uh, and we, we matter. And so um, I think those issues are still with us today. And that, so that's the ongoing challenge and struggle for, for all of us as AAPIs. Um. I want to take some questions that have come in. Um, tell me, tell me how 
how one can find a good, like, what is mentorship? And I'm going to just preface it with, I had a funny story where I was talking to a group of young people and a woman said, Hey, how am I going to know my mentor? When will my mentor appear for me? And I'm thinking some people think it's like a fairy godmother, which I said, you know, if you're thinking fairy godmother, that's not what it is. And I said, and don't walk up to somebody and say, will you be my mentor? I said, you did not walk up to your, uh, some guy at a party and say, will you be my boyfriend? You know, is that how you got your boyfriend? And she said, well, I don't have a boyfriend. So it's one of those things where you want to say, you know, as Asian Americans, um, sometimes people are so book smart that they hear the term mentor or networking, and then they want to apply it in the context of, you know, like, I guess the, the other analogy would be telling somebody you've been dating for a while, are we in love? You know, I mean, it's just kind of that, don't put a label on it. Um, what's your thoughts on mentorship? Yeah, it's a great question. I think of mentorship more as, more in the context of role models. I think we all have them and we may not realize it, but um, I have a bunch of role models I have had uh, over the years. And uh, while there was never a formal mentorship relationship or arrangement along the lines of how you described it, um, I always looked to them as great role models and examples. Um, I admired them. I admired the way they handled them. They, they conducted themselves, the way they approached certain challenges and problems, the way they speak. Um, so I think for all of us, it's a matter of identifying people in your life whom you admire for whatever reason and modeling yourself um, wherever appropriate after them, either the way, either their, their characteristics, the, the way they handle situations, the way they carry themselves, the way they speak, the way they interact with others. And so I think that's the key I would focus more on role models rather than entering into a formal mentorship relationship like, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend. It's, it's not like that. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, and so I think that's the key to find people like that whom you admire and, and um, watch them, observe them and learn from them. Um, that was a great um, answer to the question. I guess the next question somebody has is how many Asian Americans, do you think, are serving in the role that you have? Are you like one of the first um, transportation secretaries or cabinet level, state cabinet level positions? Do you know? Well, I can Sorry, only speak for, <laughs> right. I can only speak for for California state government. I'm not the first AAPI cabinet secretary. There have been others before me, and uh, right now in the Newsom administration, there are a couple of us. Um, myself and Julie Su, who was just nominated by President Biden to be Deputy Secretary at the Department of Labor. Um, so she is currently Secretary of the Labor and Workforce Development Agency. Um, she and I have become good friends since uh, we both joined the Newsom administration a um, year and a half, two years ago. And so th there, are, there are a few of us around. And I think you can say the same thing for local government, where you've got department heads who are AAPI, and of course, at the federal level, I think we generally know um, those who have held uh, cabinet positions in the past, whether it's uh, Norm Mineta, Gary Locke, uh, many, many others, uh, Elaine Chow. And so um, I think we are, are gradually growing the pipeline of people who are ready to um, assume these very senior level positions. And uh, so that's, that's, that's good. We just have to keep at it and keep, um, keep growing talent for the future, not just for this administration, but for future administrations. That's good advice. Um, I have another question here about working across the aisle. People have become some so partisan, you know, and, and really, I feel like most people are really moderate. You know, I think um, Asian Americans, um, definitely, you can't say that we're one party or the other. We have just as many um, sometimes Republicans that are AAPI as we do uh, Democrats, although the Democratic side seems to be a little heavier. What advice do you have for people working with Republicans and Democrats, you know, from either party? Well, I think having personal relationships with individuals who are in the other party is one of the keys. And um, I always think about our, our good friend, former Congressman Mike Honda. You remember when he was in Congress, um, 
he was a very well liked member. People on both sides of the, of the aisle really, really liked Mike for many reasons. Very personable individual. And also, you might remember the Washington Post did a big feature article on him, and the headline was something about Congressman Karaoke, because he loves to sing. He loves going to karaoke. Uh, and, and, and people bonded with him through karaoke, Republicans too. And I think his Republican colleagues saw him as someone they, they could work with, relate to, and get to know at a very personal level. And so if you know people at a personal level, it, it makes it much more difficult to attack them. You may, you may disagree with them, but you can disagree with them in a very civil way. So I think Mike's example is a great model for all of us that if you can develop those kinds of personal relationships with people um, on the other side of the aisle, um, that will help make things uh, go much better. I, I tend to agree. I think it's good to get to know people. And I think it's also that you can see that they're not, maybe, maybe they're getting mischaracterized in the press as being something they're not. Um, or maybe they're exactly what you see in the press, but it's good to find out for yourself, I think, rather than read press stories. Um, um, what words of advice would you have for people who are seeking to get into public service, maybe run for elected office? What kind of path would you suggest? I know I will tell the audience, I've always tried to talk David S. Kim into running for office and he's turned it down every time. And, um, you know, I'm glad he's being authentic to who he is and, you know, has done very well but what advice would you give? Well, I guess for starters to, to, uh, to give a plug to Apex and take their, take their uh, various leadership training seminars and programs. Uh, they do a great job of, of training potential uh, future candidates for office. So that's a great thing to do. Um, in addition to that, uh, it's important to be plugged into uh, your community wherever you live, uh, to be actively involved in the life of um, your city, town, county, state, um, and get to know a lot of people. And, and I think those are the keys right there. For those who are not looking to run for office, but might want to enter public service like work on the Hill or state capitol or city hall, it's much the same. Get to know people, get to know candidates running for office, immerse yourself in the issues that are important in that particular area or region. And, uh, you know, We've heard it a million times before, but networking is really important. And, and networking, not for the sake of being transactional, but to develop relationships, to develop friendships, uh, authentic friendships, uh, to be of help to people, to others. They may be of help to you, but also it's resp our responsibility to be of help to others as well. And so um, developing those kinds of relationships from a, from a friendship standpoint, I think is, is one of the keys. And um, I think that that's, that's really good words of advice. Um, our community is different in the sense that everyone's heard of Amy Chua, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mom. And, you know, there's this whole thought that there are all these tiger moms running around and that maybe we raised a bunch of people who didn't get to play on team sports, you know, didn't get to do sleepovers. Um, Elaine Chow said that she didn't get to go to her senior prom. She's still mad about that. So, you know, um, what kinds of advice can you maybe, um, is it the same advice for people who maybe have more time socializing because they have tiger parents that didn't allow them to socialize? Well, I, I think leadership development is something we, we can and should be focused on throughout our lives. You cannot take one leadership class or read one book on leadership and say, aha, I am now an expert on leadership. It, it is a lifelong journey. And I think wherever you are, you can take leadership classes, perhaps your, your, your employer offers them. You can read books on your own, watch videos, LinkedIn learning, all of those things. I think it's important for all of us to constantly develop those leadership skills because leadership skills are really about people skills mm -hmm. and um, interpersonal relationship skills, listening skills, soft skills as they are sometimes called, uh, emotional intelligence, so it's one thing to be book smart. It's another thing to be people smart. How do you get along with others? Others? How do you build relationships? Uh, how do you have? Um, how do you handle difficult situations? Things of that nature. So leadership development is what I always encourage people to do, and it's never too late to start. And you're never going to finish either. You're going to keep doing this for the rest of your life, and that's an important skill to uh, to be focused on. 
Well, I think that's a good way to end on end on that note. I know Anthony uh, wants to um, step in, and um, we're we're excited to have heard your advice from someone who is the pride of our community. Um, we all look up to you, so thank you so much for for what you do. Um, any last words before we uh, sign off? Yes, I saw a, uh, a question on the chat. I think that was from Ann Kim, who I know very well. I think she asked, what, what was the role of your parents? How did your parents influence you? And, and I will say, um, they meant everything in, in terms of uh, planting the seed. They were pretty unusual for first-generation immigrants from Korea in the sense that they were so civically engaged and they always felt they were really involved in their local community in uh, Davis, California. And they always felt that if you have a voice but don't use it, it's, it's really not worth anything. You might as well be, and, and you shouldn't be watching the game on the sidelines. You should be on the field playing in the game, not just watching. So that, their example really rubbed off on me and my brother. And uh, we learned by osmosis, their, their incredible example, which is why and how um, I came to view public service as a calling. Uh, and we all have a calling in life. And I felt that that, that was the one. And, and so um, that was because of the example set by my parents. I love it. I think that is so terrific. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jocelyn and um, Anthony. Thank you, so much. thank you so much, David and Jocelyn. It was a really captivating conversation. I'm, I'm sure we could spend all day talking about uh, AAPIs and the representation in all different levels. Um, I really resonated with the mentorship uh, conversation, uh, being a young Asian American professional, uh, working my way up and starting out. Uh, I really do hope to uh, find my mentors, not just hope that they appear out of nowhere for me, but um, as I continue to build relationships with everyone, you know, I really take that to heart. Um, just as an announcement uh, for everyone upcoming is March 11th at 9.30 a.m. We will be hosting our APAX Health Summit. Uh, you can register for that at apax.org. It'll be right on the front cover. It'll be a conversation bringing in subject matter experts, members of Congress, community leaders, all talking about various health-related issues affecting the AAPI population at large. Uh, so don't forget to register for that event. David, Jocelyn, thank you so much. Um, if you want to shout out your contact information so people can uh, reach out to you, uh, feel free to drop it in the chat or just say it. Um, this recording will be available on YouTube. Yeah, so you can sure. reach. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Jocelyn. At, uh, sorry, Jocelyn at jhongdc.com. And then David, your email or. Yes, uh, well, I'll, I'll mention a couple things. Uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. I don't use Twitter very much. I use it mostly to follow people, but it's at Kim David 63. Uh, but happy, more than happy to connect with those of you who are, are not already connected with me and definitely feel free to stay in touch and be more than happy to be a sounding board. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thanks a lot.